Well, happy Sunday, folks. Great to be with you again today, as always. And wherever you're joining us from, uh, welcome to you. My name is Steve Hopkins. I'm the pastor here at Kendricks Creek. As we get into things today, I'd just like to pray for you. Whatever you've been through this week, wherever you're going to be in the next week, I just want you to know that God is with you and he is for you. And as a church, we want to come alongside you in whatever way we can. So if you would, I'd invite you to join me as we pray together today. Just bow your heads, bow your hearts, wherever you are. Um, and just join me as we pray. So let's pray. Um, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in many different homes, in many different locations, but still one church, one body, united by your one spirit. We give thanks for that gift and thanks for the gift of technology that can help us to spread out. And just and remember that it's not about just being in one building, but it's about being your people in the course of our daily lives, living obedient to your word and, and faithfully following you wherever you are and wherever we are. And we just give thanks for that incredible gift and give you thanks for the for the opportunity to share your message and your hope with so many different people in this season. And just praise you for that. And pray um, specifically for everyone who's joining us today their families, um, that wherever they are, that they would know your presence, they would know your peace, they would know your kingdom in their lives, that uh, wherever there is hardship and pain and brokenness and hurt and uncertainty and anxiety and worry, that they would have that replaced with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Uh, we thank you for that and thank you that you do promise us that gift. And pray that right now, in this moment, in this time, in this place, uh, that we would know your presence with us, that we would know that you are here, that you were here long before we got here. You are here now and you will be here long after we leave. But give us eyes to see and ears to hear your kingdom and your voice in the midst of our everyday lives. And in particular, in this very moment and this very time, we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to join with me. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together, just an ancient prayer that Jesus gave to his church, his disciples to pray. I invite you to join with me as we pray those words together. Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, a couple announcements this morning that I just want to share with you. A few things um, you'll see in the post, whether you join us from Facebook or YouTube or in Church Online, you'll see that there's a link to subscribe to our email list. So if you're new, you're a visitor with us, you're just not connected with us in that way, um, I invite you to, to, to take that step. Just fill out that um that just take go follow that link and then subscribe to our email list. That'd just be a great way for us to stay connected. I'd love to stay in touch with you and that we could follow up throughout the weeks ahead. Don't spam you. Don't send out tons of emails in the week. Just a couple that hopefully keep you aware of what's going on here and hopefully inspire and encourage you throughout the course of your week as well. And so if you're a, a new um, guest or a visitor with us, or you've been with us for a while, the second, third, fourth time, and you just haven't really let us know that you're here, just let us know and say, hey. Um, so, hey, I'm Steve. Great to meet you. Um, we'd love to stay in touch with you and love to help you take that next step. So you'll see that that's one of the next um, things in the post or in church online is that connect. So if you want to get connected with us, we'd love to help you take the next steps in your faith journey, love to help you grow in your faith, love to help you in whatever way that you're looking uh, for, for some kind of help. We'd love to help you in that way, love to serve you and, and have next steps for you to take. So if you're wondering what that might be or you just want to reach out and say, hey, I don't really know what I need, but I need something, please do that. Fill out that contact card and let us know how we can help you. Um, third thing that I'll say today is just, uh, as, as we've talked about this before, but coming up this week, we'll talk more about this in a minute. Coming up this week is our prayer week. It's May 21st through 31st. I know that's 10 days and not technically a week, but like it's, we're calling it prayer week because that's easier than prayer 10 days. But, uh, traditionally that's the time where we set apart time to pray and to fast and to seek God's presence together as a church, as a community. Um, and so our theme this year is kingdom come. Kingdom Come, talk more on that in just a second, but do invite you to get connected with that. So if you'd like to sign up for a time slot to pray, 
you can go to unitedprayer.us. It's um, something that our church is doing, but there's a lot of other churches that are using that platform in our region, our area as well. And so I do invite you to, to check that out, uh, to sign up for a time slot to pray. You can sign up for as much or as little as you like, uh, but it's a great way for us to come together around something that's so much bigger than any one of us individually. And in the midst of just a really uncertain time where we don't have a lot of answers, we can go to the one who is unshakable, the rock that is higher than any one of us, and the eternal rock, the the foundation stone of our world. We can go there, and it's a great comfort to so many, and it's an incredible truth that we can go to God in prayer uh, wherever we are. And so do invite you to check that out and join with us. And then um, the last thing that I do want to share with you is just, again, uh, just blown away by your generosity as a church and how you're continuing to give and to step up and to serve in so many different ways. People volunteering to, to help out in a lot of different things, people stepping up to lead different groups, um, people stepping up to, to assist and to serve in just a variety of amazing and small little ways. And people who are so generously continuing to give and to tithe. Um, your income and your resources to help us invest in our community. So I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you. We depend on it, really. I mean, just to to keep the lights on, to be able to do stuff like this. I'm just so grateful for it. And so if you um, have traditionally done recurring giving, I just invite you to continue to do that. This is really... um, Really simple to do now. You can just go into the to the give section in church online or in the post on Facebook or YouTube. Just go to um, go to the give section and go to our online giving tab, and you can set up a recurring donation there. It's something that I do. It just makes it easier. I can kind of automate it and be sure that I'm giving the first fruit of uh, of my income back to the back to the community to share and to invest in. Um, so you can do the recurring gift or you can just make a one-time gift. It's, it's again, pretty easy to do through the online giving platform. You can also, if, if you're not sure how to get there, you can't, for whatever reason, find the website, just text the word Kendrick's Creek to 77977 and you'll be directed um, to our online giving page online giving page from there. And the last thing, of course, you can always send in checks. You're always welcome to do that. Um, and, and appreciate all of those gifts that come in from so many of you in so many different ways. It just helps us to be more faithful with what we have, to steward the resources that we have better, um, and to continue co- to invest in the community and to be generous outside of the walls of our building. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your gifts, and thank you for your service and for your prayers throughout the last two months. Um, I mentioned that Prayer Week was coming up this week. Uh, it's uh, it's something that you know is is pretty important. It's pretty special to me. Uh, it's something that we started really doing last year, and that we're continuing on this year. And you know, uh, it, it's such a such a gift, really, to to take some time and to set it apart. And we're not going to do the normal other business of the church, but we're going to focus our efforts and our attention on prayer. It's just so simple. It's not a complicated thing. Um, but it makes us wonder, you know, really, what is the purpose of it? And so I just want to spend some time today talking about prayer, talking about our theme for this year, Kingdom Come, and how that all relates together. And so I'll start with a story, because we love a good story. Um, uh, Lily is a pretty social butterfly, and uh, and one of the things that she um, she has struggled with over the last few weeks. Yeah, I moved my Dunkin' Donuts cup out of the frame. I felt like that'd be better. You could take me more seriously. But yeah, I drink Dunkin', so it's, it is what it is. Um, Lily has had a hard time um, adjusting the fact that she hasn't been able to see people, and, like see her friends and hang out. And she loves to be around people. She's she's an extrovert. If you're introverted like me, then it, you probably like social distance anyway, and it's not a big deal to you. <laughs> like, I mean, all things considered, you know, I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with not being around people that much. I mean, I love y'all, and I can't wait for life to go back to normal. But uh, in general, like, you know, I'm okay. But Lily's taking it pretty hard. Uh, it's very difficult for her. And so, on Mary's birthday a couple weeks ago, she had the opportunity to to see her grandparents. Um, and then again, last week to see her grandparents and man, she, she lost it. Like she was just out of control. She just could not handle the fact that she hadn't really been able to, to interact with humans other than me and her mom and her sister, 
um, in like a face-to-face -face interactive way that, that she hadn't been able to interact with them in like two months. It was just way too much for her. And so she was just so excited to be able to hang out with her grandmas and her, and her grandparents and just to, to be with them and talk to them face-to-face -face and be able to touch them and smell them and feel them. And it was just a, a wonderful opportunity. It was really cool to watch as her dad, really cool to be able to sit back and to watch this interaction. I was reminded of something as I was watching this, is that uh, physical presence is really important. You know, just being able to just sit with another human being is so important, right? And I mean, I, I love how we can do all this stuff digitally and online. I mean, I think there's a lot of real benefit to it, but, but there's really something special about being able to sit down with another person and just be able to talk with them face to face, like you're talking with a friend. And of course, that reminds me of a story in the Old Testament, the story of this guy named Moses. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he was the leader of the people of Israel when they came out of slavery in Egypt. He led them to Mount Sinai, uh, where they received the Ten Commandments, the covenant from God at that place. And, uh, and we're told that Moses would go into the place. It's called the tabernacle. They had the Ark of the Covenant in there. And we're told that Moses would go into the, to the, Ark of, into the tabernacle and he would sit there. And while he was sitting there in the tabernacle with the very presence of God, it says that, that he would speak with God face to face as one speaks with a friend. And when we talk about prayer, fundamentally, that's what prayer is. Prayer is being with God. It's not just me throwing a bunch of requests at him. It's being with him. It is his presence with us. That is prayer. It's speaking with him face to face as one speaks with a friend. It's, it's, it's certainly my request, it's my praise, it's my thanks, but it's also listening. It's also just sitting and being with him. You ever been around someone uh, that you really have a very long history with and you're so, so close with that you don't have to feel uncomfortable just sitting beside them? Maybe if you're married or you, you know, with your family, you can just sit in the same room as a person and you don't have to say anything. There's a level of comfort there. You ever do that with strangers? It's weird. Like, it's just, it's weird. Um, that's the, the kind of presence that we're talking about. To be able to sit with God and be in his presence. That's the wonderful truth about prayer. Um, and of course, you know, we talked about how our theme is kingdom come. And so you might kind of ask the question is, well, what in the world does that have to do with prayer at a very fundamental level? And what does that have to do with the presence of God? And how does that relate to this whole idea of kingdom? Uh, well, I guess first what we'll say is like, what is a kingdom? Because that maybe seems like some archaic language. Maybe you don't really know because um, it's been a long time since you played Dungeons and Dragons or World of Warcraft or something. And so you don't know what a king and a kingdom actually is in, in practice and in function. Most of the time you think of like the Queen of England and does she actually really do anything? Um, I don't, I mean, that's, you know, I'm not British, so that's not really my thing. I'm an American, and so we don't do that. Um, kings and kingdoms and queens and all that is very confusing to us. And so when we talk about the kingdom of God, what actually does it mean? Uh, well, I guess what I'll first say is everyone has a kingdom, because at a very basic level, your kingdom is where you can effectively exert your will. So I'll give you an example. Um, when my youngest daughter, Mary Elizabeth, who just turned two, when she was first born, her kingdom was very small. The place where she could exert her will was very small. She would learn to use her lungs and exert her will over them. She would exert her will over her eyes and eventually her mouth and those lungs would work very well. Uh, that was her kingdom and it was very limited. And then gradually as she got older, her kingdom would expand. And she would start to do things like roll over. And then eventually she would do things like crawl. And then eventually she would learn to walk. And then she could begin to bring other things under the dominion of her kingdom. It to bring things outside of her under the control of her will. Um, so she would take things. And those things would become part of her kingdom. And of course, if you have ever interacted with two kids in one house for maybe an extended period of a quarantine like we have, you know that things happen as a result of that. And that those two kingdoms of two little kings, that they compete with one another uh, and that they go to war over the smallest of things where they would rather exert their will than share. 
Um, and of course, what happens then is that then dad's kingdom has to intervene. And then that gets really unfortunate for everyone. And we end up on the floor crying and it's a real big mess. And we're all sad at the end of it. But the dispute has been settled and there is peace throughout the entire kingdom and all is well in the land. Uh, but you get the idea, right? Is that the idea is of a kingdom is the effective range of your will. And so when we talk then about the kingdom of God, what we want to hear is that the effective range of God's will. It is where his rule and reign is exercised. And when we look at it scripturally and biblically and historically, what does God's kingdom, the effective range of his will, look like? We see very simply that initially, right, it's all of creation. Is that God in the beginning, he creates heavens and the earth and everything in them he creates. And that is fully within his kingdom. We hear this incredible story um, from Genesis in Genesis 3 that, that God would walk in the garden in the cool of the day. And so his kingdom was there, but it was also intimately tied to his presence. That where his presence was, his kingdom was also. And we see that in his relationship with Adam and Eve, right? Is that he was with them. He talked with them. He walked with them in the garden. His presence was there with them and his kingdom was full and completely there as well. But then, of course, if you know the story, you know that Adam and Eve essentially say that they don't want his kingdom. Eve is tempted and essentially to question God's wisdom, to question that he's holding out on her. And so, uh, so what she does is she rebels against his authority. She rebels against his will. She rebels against his effectiveness over her life. And she chooses to disobey his words and his command and his will and his authority. And so essentially rebelling against his kingdom. And that separation that forms as a result, we call sin. The very simple definition of sin. It's the separation that, that, that comes when we disobey God and his word and his will and we live outside of his kingdom. So Adam and Eve sin, and the immediate response that Adam and Eve have is to hide. It says that they then recognize, they look at each other, they realize they're both naked, naked as we say in East Tennessee, they both naked, and then they get afraid, and so they cover up and they hide. They hide from one another, and they hide from God. The immediate consequence of sin is to hide, it's to be ashamed, it's to feel guilty. So they hide, they separate themselves from God, they remove themselves from his presence. So his kingdom is tied so intimately to his presence. We've said this before, but God's kingdom comes as his will is done. In the Jewish mind, the, the king was the king where he was kinging. Like where he was actively exerting his will, that's where he was the king. And of course, what sin does, it doesn't in any way um, take away God's authority, but we are removing ourselves from underneath his authority and from underneath his protection and from underneath the authority of his kingdom. And so you see what, how this is a bit of a problem, right? Is that all the good stuff that goes along with this kingdom, we also don't experience either. All of the righteousness, joy and peace, love, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, his sovereignty, his authority, his wisdom, we lose that when we don't live under his rule and his reign and his will and his kingdom. If you know, the story continues, though, is that God, of course, doesn't want this. He wants us to be in his kingdom. He wants us to live in a relationship with him. He wants us to be with him in his presence. That's what he desires. And so he calls Moses, as we mentioned earlier, to lead the people of Israel who had then been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years to bring them out of slavery and to bring them to himself. This is what we hear in Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. I think it's really helpful for us. Um, God tells Moses to tell the people this. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. See, his kingdom is connected with his presence. He says, I brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, see, it's also tied to obedience. His kingdom comes as his will is done. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a unique kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Is that God's purpose for the people of Israel is that they would be a special and unique people. His will was available and exerted throughout the entire earth. And at one level is there, right? He holds the universe together in existence. But, but at another level, what he wanted was people who would be his people, his special people, people who would be with him people who would live under his rule and reign and authority and will, people who would live in his kingdom. But specifically, he wanted a kingdom of priests. 
People who were under his kingdom, but then interceding for the world around them, that through them, the world would see his kingdom and live in his kingdom and experience his kingdom through the intercession of a special group of people who were living fully alive in his kingdom kingdom. That's where the people of Israel were meant to be. And we see that his kingdom is connected and it comes with his presence because he calls them first back to himself. But if you know how the story goes, you know, the people of Israel, they make their way into the promised land. Uh, Moses eventually dies. Joshua leads them into the promised land. They set up their nation there and they have at this time um, a governance that they set up that's kind of tribal and just based on you know their local leaders and elders throughout the land. Uh, and pretty quickly, whereas at one time God had called them to keep his covenant, to keep his laws, to keep his command, to live in his kingdom, we're told this, that in those days, the days of the judges, we're told Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, Israel had no king. And we have to qualify that, right? Because they actually did have a king. Their king was Yahweh. Their king was God. They just didn't want him to be their king. And the incredible and remarkable and gracious truth about God is that he will not force you. Very often, he will not force you to be his subject. He will not force you uh, for him to be your master. He will not force that upon you. He gives you that choice to live in his kingdom or to live outside of his kingdom, to live under his protection, rule, reign, and authority, or to live underneath your own. Uh, because that's the other thing of it is like, this is what the people said, right? In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did whatever they thought looked like the right thing for them to do. And so we have to talk about that for just a second, uh, because that seems really familiar to me. I don't know if that seems familiar to you is that very often in our world today, what is the determiner for what is right and wrong? Who is it that can determine what is true and what is false? Well, very often, right, it's whatever the individual decides. Um, it's whatever I think is good for me. It's whatever look, looks right to me. And here's where a, a little bit of a helpful ancient cultural distinction is appropriate. See, the Jewish people um, drew a line. They said that the Gentiles, the pagans, they were a people of the eyes, but we, the, the people of God, we would be a people of the ears. And what I mean by that is that, is that the Gentiles, the pagans, the Greeks, those people would be a people who did whatever looked good to them. That if something was pleasing to the eye, they would pursue it. If something looked good, they would chase after it with all they wanted. Look in the ancient world at the buildings that the Greeks and the Romans would build. They look incredible. And now look at most of the ancient Jewish structures. Well, there's not really any left. Even the, the ancient temple in Israel or in Jerusalem today, I mean, that was built under a Greek model. It was built to look impressive. But the people of Israel, they did not want to be a people of the eyes. They wanted to be a people of the ears because the people of the eyes followed whatever looked good to them. But a people of the ears would listen to the voice of God and it would be the voice of God that would guide them. And so you see here the distinction, right? is that in those days, the days where Israel had a king that was God, but they chose not to follow him, they had no centralized authority, in those days they did whatever looked good to them. They had forsaken God's way. Um, they were doing whatever seemed right to them. See, the kingdom they were not living in, and they were not acknowledging the very presence of God in their midst. And I think that's an important point for us to get, right? Is that too often when people think about God as king, they think about God as Lord of their lives or maybe king over their lives. They really tie it to a bunch of rules. And maybe it's because we say things like the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God, or it's the effective range of God's will over your life. But, but we tie it to rules, right? And maybe it's, I don't know what it is. It's just that we're religious creatures and we love to tie things to religion. And so, and so we think that like, it's all about rules. It's all about a list of do's and about don'ts. But at the end of the day, right, God gives boundaries for your protection. But at the end of the day, what he wants is you. He wants you to be with him. He wants your presence with his presence. It's before he gives any laws or commandments, he calls him to himself. So I brought you out of Egypt to be with me. 
and then I will give you instruction, and then you will understand the context for my law and my rules and the, the instructions that I give you on the way of life that you are to live that is a good life. But it starts with a foundational understanding of his presence with you. Um, and, and we so often miss that. We miss that and we forget that. And that's what so many people reject, right? When they reject Christianity or they reject Jesus or they reject God outright altogether um, or they're just kind of vaguely spiritual as so many people are today is that, is that they think that, that any kind of system of faith is all about rules but, and all about religion, and all about institution. And they miss the point that fundamentally it's all about his presence. It's all about his relationship with us. Um, so we go through the time of the judges uh, and, and where there was no king and there were just these rulers that would be raised up periodically to, to kind of settle different disputes throughout the land and externally. And, and then we come to the very last of the judges, a guy by the name of Samuel. He was a prophet um, and he was a ruler in Israel, not a king because they had a king. Their king was God. Um, and the people came to Samuel on one occasion and they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us, to go out before us and to fight our battles. And Samuel then turns to God and he says, did you hear what they said? These people say they want a king, but they got a king. You're their king. And God says, I know I'm their king. It's not you that they're rejecting, Samuel, it's me. So give the people what they want. I mean, man, be careful what you wish for, right? God might just let you have it sometimes and see where it goes. Um, They ask for a king. Not because they didn't have one, because they wanted to look like all the other nations. They wanted to look like all the other nations. You see how this plays out? They wanted to be like them. They wanted a king who looked the part to go out before them. God would fight their battles for them, but they wouldn't see him doing it. They wanted to see their king fighting their battles for them. And so God gives them a king, and he gives them a guy by the name of Saul. Now Saul looked the part. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He, he had great eyes and wonderful hair, and he was strong and muscular, and he could wield a sword and a spear like nobody else. And he was everyone's favorite king, except that he wasn't a very good king, because he was not a man after God's own heart. And he exerted authority and rules and will, but it was detached from God's compassionate reign of righteousness and joy and peace and love and patience and goodness. And so eventually Saul is no longer king, and God calls a new king, a young shepherd boy by the name of David, who would eventually become the great King David, the great leader of the people of Israel. And David does something very interesting. What David does, one of the hallmarks of his kingship, is that he brings the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark? Remember the place where Moses would go to meet with God face to face as one talks with a friend? Remember the very presence of God on earth that was symbolized? David brought the Ark of the Covenant. He brought the tabernacle and he put it in Jerusalem, in his capital city. He put the presence of God in the city of David. And so what David does, he brings back together something that was never meant to be separated. From the very foundation of creation through to Moses and the Exodus, all the way up to David, the entire point was that God's kingdom and his presence would be inextricably tied together. But what sin does is it separates those two things, and we somewhere in the middle fall out to the very bottom beneath. God's kingdom comes with his presence. It is a package deal. And what David as the king of Israel shows us is that the presence of God is always meant to be tied to his authority and his reign and his rule and where his will is done. Of course, the people had a problem. They have always had a problem. People always do have problems because we are sinners and we like to do things our way. And so the people chose in those days, again, eventually, after many generations of kings, some good, some bad, they chose to rebel again against God's will and his ways and his rule and his reign. And they do things their own way. And so eventually the people are exiled. Um, the, the Babylonian Empire in the 500s BC comes and, and, and conquers the land of Judah and Jerusalem, and that many people are exiled and carried off into the Babylonian Empire to live out the rest of their days as servants far from their home, and far from the place that symbolized the very presence of God on earth as it was in heaven, the tabernacle, the temple. It was the place where God's presence was. Um, All of which takes us to our guide for the next few weeks through this this short series that we're going to do for Prayer Week and Beyond about Kingdom Come. And our guide for the next few weeks is this prophet named Ezekiel. 
Now, Ezekiel, we're told, was a priest who worked in the temple in Jerusalem. He was a priest who had been exiled and was living in Babylon. And we're told this in Ezekiel chapter 1. It says, in my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, very specific, while I was among the exiles at the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, the Kibar River is a branch of, a, it's just a creek that runs off of the Euphrates River and it runs about 200 miles north of Babylon. And, and history and archaeology tells us that there was a Jewish settlement on the Kibar River at a little place called Tel Abib. Tel Abib. Um, anytime that you hear the word Tel, it just means like a, a, an ancient city that had been destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. And so there was this ancient Jewish settlement on the Kibar River about 200 miles north of Babylon called Tel Abib. And that's where Ezekiel is, by all accounts, writing to us from. Uh, in the 500s BC, living about 600 miles or so from Jerusalem. And so I want you to understand his context, right? Is that here is this priest who's 30 years old. It's a good age for a, for a priest, you know? And, and here's this priest who's living on the Kibar River among the exiles. Uh, they are hundreds of miles away from everything that they thought they knew about the kingdom of God. Because they knew the kingdom and the rule and the reign of the kings of Israel. And they had tied that to the kingdom of God because it was always tied to his presence. But now they had been removed from his presence. They had been exiled from his presence. And the temple was destroyed. And, and, and everything in their way of life was gone. And the Ark of the Covenant was also gone. And no one knew where it was. I mean, we know that it was in Egypt all along. Um, and it was, uh, it was excavated in the 1930s by Dr. Indiana Jones and the Nazis, and there was this huge epic fight, and eventually now it's stored in some government warehouse in Washington, D.C., with huge letters on it that says, do not open. I mean, we know that now, but back in the 500s B.C., they didn't know where it was. They didn't know where the ark was, and they were removed from the presence of God. Do you see the point? So the kingdom was destroyed in their mind. The presence of God was gone. There was no kingdom. And just, I want you to understand the significance of this, that here in this little settlement of Jewish exiles, God came to them. He showed up and spoke to Ezekiel. What he's trying to get through to them is that, listen, it's not just about a place and it's not just about a building. My kingdom is where my presence is and there is nowhere that my presence won't go. There's nowhere my presence won't go. David understood this. He understood it. He wrote it in Psalm 139. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the very depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. There is nowhere you can go that you can escape from God's presence. Some of you need to hear that for a couple different reasons. Some of you need to know that whatever you've been walking through, whatever challenges you've been facing, you may feel like you're alone. You may be socially distanced. You may be socially isolated, but you are never alone. There is nowhere that you can go that God is not with you. There is nowhere that you can go that God is not with you. I want to encourage you in that today. And some of you need to hear that for the opposite reason. Is that you've been living your life like God can't see what you're doing. You've been doing things in the dark that you think can stay hidden in the dark. But Jesus said that what has been done in the dark will be shouted from the rooftops in the middle of the day. There is nowhere that you can go that God has not seen. Some of us need to remember that. The things that we would rather that, that just be unseen and just kind of shoved down beneath the surface, some kind of secret hidden sins and some other things that we don't want anyone else to know about. God knows. He knows. But here's the incredibly good news. He knows and he still comes to you anyway. He knows all of your sin. He knows all of the burdens and the struggles and the pain and your rejection of him. He knows it and he still comes to you and he offers himself to you and for you because it's while we were sinners that Jesus died on a cross. While you were at your absolute worst, Jesus died for you, knowing full well everything that you've done, said and thought. He dies for you that you could have a relationship with him at that moment. That's good news. And some of you probably need to hear that as well. But the bottom line is that there's nowhere that's too far gone for God. Not in your life, 
not in your addictions, not in your sin, and not in Jewish exiles in the 500s BC living along the Kibar River who had done everything they could um, to remember what it was like to live in God's presence. There's nowhere that's too far gone for his presence. There's no place, no circumstance, no sin, no guilt, nothing that can keep him from coming to you. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Romans 8. He said, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. There is neither neither sword and war or famine or persecution or, or lack of shelter or clothing. Nothing. No angels or demons. Nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. He shows up. He's always there. And he keeps coming. His presence is there. And his kingdom comes with his presence. Um, and there's a really important line that Ezekiel gives us, uh, just a scripture that we want to dwell on for just a little bit, just a few more minutes. And, and Ezekiel gives it to us like this. This comes to us in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 24 through 28. It's one of the very key promises that Ezekiel is given to give to these exiles, to give to these people, to give these people who had no hope, to give these people who thought the presence of God had abandoned them, to give to these people who thought that all, all that they knew and loved and thought was gone, that the kingdom was destroyed. And Ezekiel gives them this. God gives them this through Ezekiel. It says, My servant David will once again be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever, and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my tabernacle among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy, when my tabernacle is among them forever. That David, the great king of Israel, the great leader of Israel, there would be a king like him in his very line who would one day come and he would rule the peoples of the earth. He would rule over Israel and there would be the very presence of God among them, that they would be his people and he would be their God, that they would once again become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation through which the entire world would see and know the goodness and the extravagance and the love of God and what it would look like to live in his kingdom and how you could live a life of abundance and peace and joy and righteousness in his kingdom. That is the promise that Ezekiel is giving to the people. And it was a promise, but it was a promise that took some time. Because it was about 500 years later that there was a man named Jesus. A young boy born in the line of David, in the city of David in Bethlehem, who would then go up to the Galilee and proclaim a message. And his message was very simple. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is here. And the kingdom comes with his presence. That you can again, as you once imagined could have been done before, you can live under the rule and reign and will of God again. You can live under his sovereignty and his protection and in his peace again. And you do it through me. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the gate to the kingdom. If you come to me, you can live in my kingdom and it will give you rest. Just take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you will receive the rest that your soul longs for in my kingdom and under my authority. That's what he says. John puts it like this. He says that the word, the very eternal presence of God, became flesh and tabernacled among the people. What we see in Jesus, the very presence of God, comes into the midst of history, in the middle of this earth, and just dwells among us. And he invites us into his kingdom. That here and now and through Jesus, something uniquely happens in which he's extending his kingdom to all people in every place, in every time, of every language, tongue, tribe, and creed, that they can live under the authority of his kingdom. That is very hard for us to understand. But that is the essential message of Jesus. That is what he lived and he taught and he proclaimed. And that is what he died for. 
is so that people would know that they can live in the very presence of God in the course of their daily lives. When we talk about the kingdom, it is a future reality, absolutely. A kingdom where there are no more tears, there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more heartbreak, no more sorrow, no more sin, and no more death. That is a future reality. But what Jesus taught his disciples to pray was your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as is in heaven. That you would reach out and pull the kingdom of God into the middle of this history, in the middle of this earth, because it is only through Jesus that the kingdom comes. The kingdom comes through his presence. And when we have Jesus, you have the very presence of the eternal God who created the cosmos, living and walking and breathing and eating among you. That is the power of prayer. That we would pray and enter into the very presence of God and that we are praying that his kingdom would come in the midst of our lives. Because as much as it's a future reality, it's not just a future reality. It's something that's meant to be realized in the course of our daily lives. That's what Jesus meant. This very simply, it would be something that we would know and understand and live with every day and every moment of our lives. To live in his kingdom as we do his will And we live with him in his presence and go with him throughout our everyday life. So many people think of of, um, Christianity as just a, a series of spiritual and religious activities. And that prayer is something that I do when I can sit down and fold my hands and close my eyes and say, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. And I pray in the morning and I pray at mealtimes and I pray at bed. And that's all well and fine and good. But living in the kingdom of God is so much more than that. It's not about following a bunch of religious rules or just living according to what an institution says. It's about living in a relationship with him, going throughout the course of your daily life. I mean, waking up and having breakfast and putting on pants and brushing your teeth and going to work, which for many of you is like walking across the house right now and going to work and doing your work with him and having dinner with him. And then in the evening when you entertain yourself, however you entertain yourself, that you would do it with him. And that as you lay down to sleep, you know that God is with you. That that living in the kingdom of God is about going through the course of your everyday life with him. And now as we tie all that back to the idea of prayer and prayer week, we remember and we recall that what Jesus says for his people to do is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the other stuff that we so often worry about, God will take care of it. But you just need to seek first his kingdom. You need to seek first his presence. And he'll take care of everything else. And so sometimes what we need to do is is to really prioritize that. right? To, To enact the same kind of life that Jesus did. And to set aside some time to be apart from our normal routines. So that when we go back to our normal routines, we can carry the presence of God with us. And we can be aware of what he is doing in our lives because of the time that we spent with him before. That's why like prayer is such an important thing to do, I think, personally, first thing in the morning. What, is, what are you taking into your life when you first wake up? Are you rolling over and flipping through Instagram? Are you turning on the news? I mean, what are the first voices in your day? What if you flip the script and you let Jesus be the first voice in your day? And that from that place, you would live the rest of your life from that source of his presence. Uh, I've used this analogy before, but it's just like the piano sitting over to my left. Um, However it looks on your screen, you can't see it, but it's over there. Is that um, you don't play that piano and then have a big performance and then say, that was pretty good. I think we need to go tune up this piano. No, no, no. You tune it and make sure it sounds good before you play. And that's what prayer is like. It's setting aside times of prayer, I mean. Because it's, it's setting aside that time to be with God and then go through the course of your life with him going along the way. And so I just want to invite you into that. That's what prayer week is about. That's what this 10 days are about, is about reorienting and repurposing and redirecting our lives to live fully alive in his kingdom and to pray literally that his kingdom would come, that we would see and experience that in the course of our lives. And so I'd like to invite you to how you can participate in this week. I'd like to invite you to join me, to sign up for a slot in the prayer to, to pray. Um, usually we'd have you come to the prayer room, but because everything that's going on, you don't even have to go anywhere. You can just stay at home and set aside some time and sign up for, for a spot. You go to unitedprayer.us and you can sign up 
for a time slot to pray. Um, there's resources. There's a lot of things available. If you're not sure how to pray, don't be ashamed. You'd be surprised at how many people don't really know how to pray. But one of the best things to do is if you don't know how to pray, is just ask Jesus. Lord, teach us how to pray. Uh, and then he gave his disciples that prayer, that great prayer that we prayed at the beginning. They asked him how to pray, and he told them how to pray. So ask Jesus to show you how to pray in any given situation. So first invitation, how will you pray over the course of this prayer 10 days? May 21st to 31st, how will you pray? What will that look like for you? What days or times will you sign up? Will you just sign up for one 30-minute time block over the course of 10 days? That's amazing and wonderful. And God bless you and thank you for it. Really do. Are you going to institute a new practice and rhythm of prayer? Maybe, maybe set aside that first five minutes of your day to be with him, to purposefully be with him. Maybe that five minutes goes to 10 minutes or to 15 minutes. Maybe it's just you sit down with that first cup of coffee in the morning and you have that first cup of coffee with Jesus. Maybe that second cup of coffee with Jesus too. Some of y'all need it. Um, me included. How will you pray in this time? And the second part of that is that any time that um, as, a, as a series of discipline, spiritual discipline, this sounds like a kind of scary, weird word. It just means practices that we do um, in, in, in the spiritual life with God. So one part of that is prayer. And the second part of that is, is fasting. And so biblically, fasting is just abstaining from something. Very traditionally, it's abstaining from food. Food is a pretty fundamental thing. We all need it at some degree, but you can go without it for a time. And so fasting is just giving up food for a time. Um, one, I had a professor who told a story. He was at a conference with one, one lady who's a, who was an old Pentecostal lady, just a little old lady who was a prayer warrior. And, and they, he was talking to her about prayer and fasting. And she said this, she said that prayer opens the hand of the father and fasting binds the hand of the devil. Prayer opens the hand of the Father and fasting binds the hands of the devil. And so very often when you go into a more intense focus season of prayer, you include fasting alongside it. So just invite you to think of how you might fast in the season. Maybe you fasted before, maybe you haven't. Um, so just a couple ideas, illustrations for you. Maybe what you want to do is to fast from food for 10 days, right? Maybe that's what that looks like for you. Um, it's doable. It's very possible, especially if you do something like a juice fast, or maybe you drink juice or, or broth where you just don't eat solid food. Um, if that's something that you're not sure about, you've never done it before, reach out to someone, reach out to me, talk to a doctor. We'll see what we can, what we can figure out for you. Um, maybe that's a way that you could participate. Maybe, maybe you can't do that, whether it's work or life or whatever health reasons you can't do that. That's totally fine. Maybe it's like skipping a meal and choosing to fast a meal. Maybe it's fasting a certain kind of food. Maybe it's um, like a Daniel, what Daniel does in the book of Daniel, he just eats vegetables and fruit. Uh, maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's just, but it's the idea is that you're denying something that you otherwise wouldn't deny um, to choose to focus then instead and engage with God in prayer. So how might you fast? And as I said, maybe if it's not food for you, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's your phone. Maybe it's the news. Whatever it might be, right? It was fasting from something. Prayer is the thing you pick up. Fasting is the thing that you're laying down. And then the third thing that I'd like you to consider, and, and quite honestly, um, is maybe one of the most important ones, is, uh, is to just to look at your life. And you can ask God to help you with this, to ask him to search you and reveal to you these places in your life, in the life of people around you, in your family, in your home, in your workplace, in your church, and wherever you are. Um, where is there discrepancy between his kingdom and reality, right? And what I mean is like, where is the difference between how I am living my life and what his kingdom actually looks like? Am I living in his kingdom? Is every part of me surrendered to his kingdom? What areas of my life are not, I am not, am I not bringing under the authority of his kingdom? What does that look like for you? I mean, of course, there's all sorts of ways we see it, right? All sorts of things out there that we see. Different situations and addictions and disease and pain and suffering and hurt and homelessness and joblessness and financial insecurity and all sorts of other stuff that is not, that is not in his will. Um, so where is that like out there? And then where is that like in here? Ask him to reveal that. And then in this 10 days to pray that, that his kingdom would come into those places, that, that would be brought down into those places, and that his righteousness, his joy, his peace, his authority 
his love will be brought into those places in your life and the life of the world around you. That's prayer. It's very simple. And it's an invitation. I hope that you do join in some small way. Uh, That starts this Thursday, the 21st of May, and goes for 10 days. I want to pray for you as we go out from this space today. Um, And then we'll we'll get on with our way. Okay, so if you would, just invite you to to bow your heads, pray with me um, this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you are good and that you come to us in the course of our everyday lives and that you invite us to live life with you not to get away to some special place all the time, that that is important and solitude is really valuable, but, but that we would invite you into the course of our lives because you're already there and you just want us to live out of a relationship with you. That everything that we do, our work, our rest, our play, our, our eating, our drinking, everything would be done to your glory and with you in our minds and in our hearts. And so I pray that for everyone who's joined us today that you would bless them that you would hold them close to you. You would make your face shine upon them. That they would know the goodness of your face. That they would talk to you face to face as one talks with a friend. That you would be gracious to them. That you extend your favor upon them and over them for them and their children and their children's children. That you would lift up your eyes upon them, that they would know that you see them and that you see all of their hurt and all of their pain, all of their struggles, and that you would give them in the course of their lives your very peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that very often the world says we cannot afford, but a peace that you give to us as we live with you in your kingdom. I pray that you would open their eyes to see how they might engage with you over the next two weeks, how they might deepen a relationship with you, and how they might lift up the burdens of some of those around them. We thank you for this incredible gift of prayer, that you would deem us worthy to affect change in the world around us simply by talking and being with you. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who gives us life. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us today. If you do want to sign up, go to unitedprayer.us. You can find all of that stuff there. And if you got any questions, as always, don't hesitate to reach us. Reach out and let us know how we can help you. Praying for you all. Have a great week and make a great day.